All right, so Jonathan, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, it's so a little bit about me. Uh, Jonathan Salazar, prototype engineer, going on about three years strong here at Olympus Controls. So about my role, I am more mechanically based. So I do a lot of you know custom CAD work, custom designs, extrusion manufacturing. But I got some background with the UR robots. So I also do a lot of like customer support. I do a lot of programming with the UR robots. I do our training studio in the office, core and advanced training for UR robots as well as customer support, uh, deployment of new robot cells, palletizing applications, et cetera. So. As far as just automation goes in general, um, I think there are a lot of kind of misconceptions people have as well. What are some of those things we have to set expectations early on? Sure, so again, going back to that scope of work, kind of companies think that's easy to automate anything, especially if they're new to it. So I'll say, hey, you know, we got this process. It's like our biggest, you know, bottleneck. It's a super complicated process. We want to start with that application. So we want to start with, you know, the more complicated application, that involves like multiple parts, multiple machines, maybe handshake between, you know, a brake press and kind of area scanner, you know, so uh, a lot of machine interfacing, a lot of, you know, varying parts, maybe it's multiple SKUs running through that thing. And so they always want to tackle the biggest one first because that's got the biggest ROI. We come in and say, okay, well, we could start there, but again, we do pitch kind of the low hanging fruit first. So we want to start with that easier application, maybe the simple machine tending application where we're just doing a pick and place back and forth all day very repeatable parts, repeatable fixturing, or the palletizer where we come in and it picks up uh, the same box all day, every day, or the same couple boxes and palletizing the same thing. So kind of starting with the good application uh, is a good way of doing it. If not, and they still want to do, you know, the more complicated option, I'd say as long as we have a nice, clearly defined scope of work, that's a good first start. We kind of outline from our proposal what we expect for it to automate and kind of what the success criteria is and what is kind of outside the scope of work. That way, at least we get kind of a clearly defined project in front of us that we can tackle and not be worried about scope creep coming into it and say, oh, well, actually, we change our mind. We want to do this kind of material or this cycle time is different or these new variables. We kind of want to limit that noise and keep it to a very clear defined uh, project scope work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When there's ambiguity, it's easy to kind of tack things on, um, and that creates a lot of additional complexity. So if I have a machine, say a palletizer, um, or maybe it's a similar operation, some type of pick and place, is, am I just kind of stuck with that? Could I add functionality on that? Could I use different tools? Would, would it be difficult? Am I stuck with that application, or could I add features or functionality to it? Sure. So with the palletizer, it's kind of a tool for a certain application. So that whole system from Robotique is designed to palletize or depalletize boxes. So that specific hardware is set up for that palletizer depalletize application. But the Copilot itself is very redeployable and a lot of uh, different things you can do it for, a lot of different uh, uses for it. So with the UR, uh, they have a lot of different products. They have the UR Plus uh, uh, support network. And so basically, Multiple third parties have come in and designed either custom hardware, software, or kind of integration UR caps for it. So the robot is very redeployable. You might need to change up like the fixturing for it, the stand, uh, and then maybe a custom gripper for it. We're seeing a lot more people interested uh, in palletizing. Um, so obviously something must have changed. Uh, what is it you think recently that's happened that's causing a lot more people to be able to deploy this type of automation uh, in palletizing? Yeah. To me, one of the biggest factors is the newer robot sizes. So new cobots, uh, UR just came out with the UR20. So it's got a little bit more uh, reach as well as a higher payload. So the UR20 picks up 20 kilograms, about 44 pounds. What's some like, just as far as you've seen product wise too, we're talking like big, heavy, like liquids, rock, Box, food, like what, what are you seeing commonly that people are palletizing here? So very typical with boxes, uh, any kind of box. Uh, we've seen a lot of success in the uh, food industry. So we've seen a lot of boxes containing, you know, kind of food products, prepackaged things. Nothing in raw form, but already prepackaged kind of food stuff already coming down the line. A uh, new one working on right now is like big buckets. So five pound bucket pails that contain some kind of, you know, liquid inside of them. Yeah. Are those buckets, are they going to go on a, does it have to go on a pallet or can you like put it on the floor? Can you put something else? How does that generally work? So for the robotic solution specifically, it's really uh, based on a pallet. So a solid wood or a plastic pallet with certain dimensions and the product goes on top of that. You can get so, customizable with it, you can get kind of fancy with it, but what we've seen currently mostly is the actual pallet. Got it. So if you want a high chance of success, if you have a pallet already, it's going to make things a lot easier. Correct. A standard... In itself, like, you know, set dimension, it's not going to vary too much. Not a lot of varying heights, varying qualities. Some people tend to reuse pallets. It's better if you have, like, you know, just the one size pallet. You know? I pride myself on our ability to use this pallet as many times as possible. So you're saying it's maybe fresher is better. 
The only refresher is better, but as long as they're all pretty much the same, you know, out of dimensions, you know, standard 40 by 40 or 40 by 48 pallet. So you're you're always putting things on pallets, or could you even unload pallets? Sure. Instead of for both, you can palletize stuff onto a pallet or depalletize from a pallet. Okay. Just keep in mind, the robot expects a very standard pattern. If it's palletizing, it's easy, but if you're depalletizing, if you load these pallets by hand, you got to make sure you kind of keep them within a general, you know, uh, area. So you can't, I can't load up a pallet of just random things and it just knows intelligently with AI. Correct. It does work off like a set pattern and kind of based on that pattern and some set position to pick up and drop off from. So if I have, I have one product and one pallet, but maybe the next pallet's going to be a different product, but it's the same. Is that, is that okay? Can I still do that? Or how sure. That okay. You can do multiple recipes. So multiple even uh, box sizes, box weights, even different patterns. As long as the operator on the GUI screen tells them, you know, where to, uh, which box they're running on which pallet, it'll uh, accommodate to that pretty easy. So you said the operator does that. So that's someone on the line itself, or do I have to have an engineer that comes out to fix it for them? How does that generally work? Sure. So with the, this current uh, pilot technical solution, it's got a very nice intuitive GUI. And so it's got a nice visual guide. It kind of shows you on the screen, kind of, uh, again, at a quick glance, which sides of the conveyor you're running, if you're doing left, right, or both and then which pattern and which uh, recipe you're running on either pallet. So it's a left one's running your know, recipe one, right one's running recipe two. So that tells the robot which patterns to run and which box size and weight to run. Yeah, so in, in robot world, it's like XYZ, RX, RY, a lot of robot coordinates. So you're saying that's not necessary in this? Correct, so with this built-in UR cap for the pallet uh, very simple, you don't need to do any kind of coordinate, you know, XYZ teaching. All it is is based on one pickup point. So you physically teach the robot to pick up the, from one spot. And based on that pickup spot, you kind of teach maybe some kind of obstacle avoidance. So some quick measurements, just saying, you know, here's how wide the conveyor is, here's how tall the guarding is, the sides are, to kind of help the robot avoid crashing into the side guardrails. Besides that, the only thing you need to teach is, like we mentioned, the pallet dimensions. So again, length, width, and height of the pallet, uh, and then the box dimension. So uh, length, width, and height of the box, and then the weight of it. So it sounds pretty simple. Uh, I imagine every application has its quirks, though. What are some of those common quirks you've seen that you maybe have to work around that don't fit quite with that? Yep. Common quirks, I'd say for sure, an end stop is very uh, required for applications. You want a very repeatable uh, end stop for that box. You want it to come to a complete stop and kind of be aligned in a certain way. Again, everything the robot does is based off that pick point. If the box is somehow shifted or misaligned on that pick, the robot doesn't know. And those small variations over time, those tolerances stack up, you can actually have boxes crash into each other. I'm picturing a box as you go up, it just gets wobblier and wobblier as it gets taller. Wobblier, or it can be even just like corners hitting, you know, and the approach coming in, it could like smack and, you know, cause separate stops. So that's it's the main one. Uh, we've seen issues with like upstream processes. Uh, it's a very common issue with industry that a lot of boxes come from the factory misshaped, you know, a little bit of variation tolerances in the boxes. That trickles downhill, so then the box directors start you know, messing up, jamming up, or they don't tape right. And so you have like misshaped boxes coming down the line. The robot, again, doesn't quite know how to account for that, so you've got to kind of get more creative with your programming. There are workarounds. You can update your approach points. You can do things like you know, different approaches or force sensing, but it does add a little bit of time. So, so you can work around it, but it just you're going to add to your cycle time as you look for those different right. things. Not a deal breaker, but it's more of something to be aware of. I think it's an important lesson, too. It's, it's something like you can work around those errors, but it, it sounds like that's just going to add the, the additional time, too. If you count for those different scenarios, it'll have to make that decision every time. It just doesn't intelligently know. Correct. No. And I was surprised, too, when you mentioned, uh, you say misshapen boxes. The first thing in my head, I picture things that are collapsed, crushed, weird, but it actually seemed a lot uh, tighter than I was mentioning. You mentioned like quarter inch dimensions. So it's relative. I'd say uh, most boxes are, as long as they come down the line, they're pretty close. But yeah, from our uh, last application here, uh, placed up in Little Rock, their boxes were coming down the line pretty, pretty good, pretty consistent on the taping. But the boxes themselves varied in size slightly. So it's a quarter inch. It could be a little bit wider, a little bit longer. Height was pretty consistent, but just the length and the width kind of varied a little bit. And what we saw is uh, if the boxes were too short, it'd leave a gap in the middle. Think of those two tolerances, quarter inch to quarter inch leaves about a half inch gap. If, and then vice versa, if they're too big, then they could crash. The yeah, so you say crash, and uh, obviously I, I drive vehicles, crashing sounds pretty terrible. Um, what, is, what, is, what do you mean when you say crash whenever this, uh, what does that look like as far as the crashing, the recovery, how does that work? Gotcha. Yeah, crashing sounds pretty hard. Yeah, it's a light protective stop. So these are cobots, so they're made to basically work around humans to be safe to work around. All six of those joints are always feeling for that force. If it ever spikes past that allowed curtain, it'll go into a brick stop. It just activates the bricks of the robot. 
And so pre-easy recovery, if it's a simple protective stop, all you gotta do is basically make sure the air is cleared, make sure you know the box is free. If it's free to continue, you can just hit play on the button on the uh, teach pendant, and that'll pick up where it left off. It'll continue its motion, continue its pattern. If it's a more advanced crash, sometimes they have like, you know, it hits twice or it's a more hard hit, the robot does throw a full fault. All that means is you gotta reinitialize the robot, turn it back on, release those brakes, and restart the program. Is that something we, we call the maintenance team for? Do they help out? Um, how, who's generally the one that's able to fix that issue? So it's pretty intuitive, so you'd say the operators can do it. Um, any operator with you know, some semi-knowledge of a robot. It's pushing two buttons, you know, maybe release the gripper, grab the box out of the way, make sure it's clear. Each, like I said, application has its quirks. What does that typically look like from, um, let's start whenever you first meet and visit the site to see what's possible all the way up to kind of day one getting there. What prep work is needed before you can even start with that deployment? Sure, so first step is going on site, seeing the process, seeing what kind of product we're picking up. Again, it depends on the weight of the, uh, the product. If it's a box, you know, box dimensions. Um, from there, uh, a couple com common questions are, is there a label on the side of the box? You know, does it need to be facing a certain way? Something to keep in mind. Uh, what kind of material we're picking up? If it's a box, you have know, corrugate material, how good that seal is on the box, if there's any kind of you know, mismatched, uneven surfaces. If it's something like a bucket or a pail, you know, um, what kind of material it is, you know, can we pick up from the top of the lid, does it need to be a side pick, et cetera. So kind of qualifying the pickup of the actual material, that's a good first one. Uh, quantifying if there's, you know, varying parts. Are there multiple sizes of parts, multiple weights, something you need to be aware of. Again, it's all doable, just something to be aware of for scope of the projects. Um, any kind of, you know, again, upstream errors, any kind of upstream problems coming down the line, uh, misshapen boxes, misaligned parts, you know, make sure we have that end stop kind of set up or adding a new conveyor to account for that end stop or the queuing system. So really it sounds like it's just accounting for the variance. Variance in the process, variance in the product, and then once you understand those, you can see maybe how they fit better into this solution. So as you mentioned, end stops. Uh, what are some other tiny tweaks you have to make? Are there any sensors? Are there any other rails or anything like that you have to factor in? Sure, so an uh, ideal application would be the robot uh, has a proc sensor mounted on the conveyor. That way the robot is triggered to know when the box is present. Uh, and ideally the robot is also controlling the conveyor. And that way we kind of control the uh, flow of box coming in and we limit that back pressure. We have seen a couple of instances where that back pressure builds up over a full conveyor line. And with all those boxes pushing in, it kind of does shear the box off the gripper. Yeah, and that back pressure really, because we're talking about lifting a 40 pound box and if its friend is pushing against it, that's- Yeah, if you have three 40 pound boxes stacked up here, it's a lot of you know, side pressure, a lot of shear force on that cups. Cups do great picking up boxes from the straight up and down position. But if you have some kind of like shear force or horizontal action on it, tangential force, it does kind of tend to shear the box off. That makes sense. A lot of palletizers I see, it's kind of like the crane game. It's just straight up, straight down. There's not a lot of extra movement there. And that's just to keep that suction on the box. Yeah, optimize the use of the tool, yeah, I'd say. Once we kind of understand, okay, what are the, just how does it fit there? I think another restriction too is maybe speed. Is there any kind of speed restriction? So the conservative uh, estimate from Robotique is that it does 10 boxes a minute. It's doing one box at a time. Because of the uh, redesigned robots with a higher payload, we can do multiple picks. So their off-the-shelf tooling that comes with the Palthizer as an option it has two channels of vacuum, so you can actually pick up two boxes. If that case, you know, you double your cycle time, now you have 20 boxes per minute. Got it, so it's, it's, more, it's not really 10 boxes or parts, it's more like 10 picks per minute. 10 full cycles of pick to drop off, then how many boxes you can pick up kind of doubles or multiplies that. But what are some things that can impact that though? Is there, are there ways we could, we talked about multiple uh, parts per pick, are there any things that could cause it to go slower potentially as well? Sure, so go slower. Again, if there's any kind of variation in the process, let's say the boxes are kind of misshapen or we kind of, kind of have like a wider approach or a for, force touch off, that does kind of add some time there. So we think about it, the box is coming in. If it's just dropping off in one spot and going back and forth, it's a lot better cycle time. You drop off, come back, drop off. Uh, so minimal wait time. But we have seen in cases where there is kind of variation in the boxes, the product, we do have to kind of make a more dramatic approach angle. So we come in from a little bit bigger of a gap and then we'll do a touch off. So we'll touch off on the X, Y, and Z to ensure the box is kind of placed correctly where you want it. Okay, so that's nice too. So if I don't have the ability to just get it really squeezed in, we, we, the robot can actually kind of do that itself to figure out where it's at. Correct, and it's still pretty quick, a couple seconds per you know, pick, but it still can limit your cycle time slightly. What does that deployment look like? Um, are we bringing a team out there, kind of shutting the line down for a week? Uh, tell me about, I guess, day one. So typical installation, we allot, let's say, three days for the full install, if it's, you know, a very relatively simple uh, install. That's like three days per palletizer, you said? 
Three days per Paltaz would be safe. Concerned. Pretty fast, that's why I want to confirm. <laughs> We've had double, but we can get them all in in four days, so relatively. But yeah, let's say three days per Paltaz line, be conservative. Uh, day one consists of us making sure all the materials there on site. So again, we'll ship it out to the customer. Uh, it'll show up on site. We confirm before we go out there, hey, everything's there. You, know, you have your robots, your you know, seventh axis from Robotik, or the palletizer. You have the uh, tooling, any kind of cable management stuff, any kind of uh, conveyors. So assuming all that's there, we show up on site. And from there is when the clock starts. Day one is typically just uh, breaking down boxes, opening up the crates. So we'll take uh, open the crates for the conveyors and the palletizer, and we'll set those up. Uh, from our conveyor supplier, we usually set up the conveyor relatively fast, pull them out the crates, uh, assemble any kind of parts, motors, gearboxes, get that up and running. And then we also uncrate the palletizer. So it's a very nice system Robotique has. They come in these nice single crates, and the robot's got a separate crate. And we spend maybe half a day uncrating it. Again, taking sides off the crates. We pull out the either the seventh axis or the pedestal, and then the base of it. So very relatively simple. It's got the forklifts to be able to be picked up by a forklift or a pallet jack. And so moving around is pretty easy. In parts, you can also manhandle it to kind of assemble it on site. And again, pretty simple. Mostly it's just uh, slapping the two parts together. Either the seventh axis comes up or the pedestal comes up. Assembles to the base. You run some cables in through the middle of it for either the robot cable and then pneumatics, maybe power cable. A couple cables going through the column. And from then you uh, mount the robot. Do a couple calibrations to kind of make sure it's centered. Uh, cable match with the robot if you have any kind of custom tooling. So run the lines back through the conveyor, uh, power cables, stuff like that. Make sure the sensor's set up for the uh, conveyor. And that's about it. So it's say one full day for just uncrating and mount the robot to the pallet itself and drop it in place. Okay, so step step one, day one, everything's mechanically ready. Mechanically ready, go. assembled, yeah, out of the crates, kind of ready to go. Awesome. Well, it's exciting having it all on the line looking like it's going. So what's, what does it take to actually make it do something useful? I guess that's day two then we're talking yep. about. So let's say day two, typically, uh, it'll be actually uh, deploying it. And so we got to make sure that the robot is mounted in place. We do recommend you bolt to the ground. Yeah, let's talk about that just for a little bit, because I know the variability is, is something it's, it's good. It's modular, it's mobile. But what are the, some of the trade-offs you make when you rigidly bolt it versus having it be mobile? What, what's the difference there? So again, the robot is very repeatable. So it'll come back to the same spot over and over again. The problem is, if there's any kind of variation in its environment, it does not know that. There's no way for it to know that it moved a little bit. And so the trade-off is when you make something mobile, it's more convenient maybe for your operation. You can get out of the way to clean the area or switch between lines. But the trade-off is you might lose some of that repeatability of the robot if you misalign it on the way back. So it's really the trade-off seems to be it's the, the, the save redeployment time. However, your cycle time may be a little bit slower just to, due to the, that adaptability we need to program in potentially. So. Sure, that too. Those are pretty simple. Again, it's based on that one pickup point. So you can always just reteach that one point and the robot takes up from there. Oh, that's an excellent point. So if you're willing to reteach it as you move it, potentially you could redeploy it more simply. Correct, because the pallets are relative to the actual seventh axis. So the pallets relative to the robot should not never move. Perfect. All right, sorry interrupting. You said you anchored it down as we prefer. Uh, what comes next after that? Yep, so next we go into uh, teaching the wizard. So again, the palletizer's got a nice built-in software, nice GUI software. It's based on the dimensions of the pallets. So again, measure the pallets, give the dimensions of length, width, and height. And from there you go into teaching the box. So you say, okay, here's my you know, box for this, you know, let's say, first recipe. So we give it the length, width, and height. So we give it those dimensions and then the payload of the, of the box, how much it weighs in kilograms. From then, you can get to the label. Does the box have a label we got to account for? Do we need to orient it a certain way? So we got to teach it relative to the tool of the robot where that label's facing. So again, typically four options to the box. It can be side A, B, A negative, or B negative. So four different options for the label relative to the tool. Once the robot knows that, then we can then get into patterning. So we can go into the software again. The next option is the pattern. So we can drop in multiple patterns. You can have, I think, up to like five or six patterns. So a lot of different SKUs. But basically, it's based on the box dimension. It's got a nice little intuitive GUI. So when you add in into the GUI, it shows you kind of your uh, a little visual of your current pallet dimensions. As you add in boxes, it drops in a square representing an actual box of your product. So kind of a 2D top view of it. It shows your pallet as well as your box, as well as the label placing. So if you did include a label on there, it'll show you where the label's facing. And from there, easy enough, you just drag and drop and add in the boxes as you want those pallets to be uh, patterned out. So you create multiple patterns uh, in the GUI. Again, you have multiple different patterns. If layer by layer it varies, 
There's also some nice tools in there. You can do like copy and paste. You can do like mirror the pattern or uh, invert it 80 degrees, 90 degrees to kind of rotate them. So again, some nice built-in uh, features for that. But once you do have your pattern set up, you go back out and you say how many layers per palette. So again, you can build out your palette. You'd say this palette is nine layers, seven layers hollow, et cetera. And then how those patterns are built out in the palette. So if layer one is pattern A, layer two is pattern B, layer three is pattern C, or any kind of variation. It could be A, B, C, A, B, A, B, or all A's, middle one C, and then all A's. So you can have the freedom to kind of build out the pattern. So imagine if someone, say, they just decided to move the label applicator on the other side. What, what is that? Is that just a flip of a switch? How do you, is that easy to do? Do I have to change that one, everything? All you do is you go into your box dimensions and say, hey, my label is now 180 degrees. It's on you know, side B negative now. So and your pattern know. automatically updates. It sounds like uh, you can even train the team there too. So we, we're not having to come out to reprogram things. They don't need an expert. Are you, is there any kind of training that's provided there to help people work on the system? Correct. So yeah, so finishing out day two, that's kind of teaching of the process. And then we just kind of test for a while. We become the pot tester ourselves. So we'll load boxes back and forth, run it all day. Kind of manual labor of picking up boxes and putting on the conveyor. How much do you enjoy that, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice when we get it running nice, you know? <laughs> The less, the better, definitely, for the backache. But uh, it's a pretty good process, though. You get kind of a feel for what the process is. And again, we'll test that second day to kind of make sure it's running nice and smoothly. We'll teach all different skews of the, uh, of the different box sizes, all different box configurations, pattern-wise, or different box type. And we'll get it up and running on day two, normally. A nice and smooth operation. So then day three is focused on, again, tightening it up, so making it make sure it's nice and robust, and then training the operators. So for that, we usually account for about two hours of the operator's time. We'll kind of make sure they see it running. We'll walk them through how to recover from crashes, so any kind of prick to stops or full crashes, how you recover the robots, how you operate the gripper, you know, for any kind of emergency. But typically, it's just based on that GUI system. So how you teach those boxes, how you teach the patterns. And again, even that can be minimal. Some operators don't want, some companies don't want the operators to have full access. So we'll set a password guard to kind of limit that. All they have access to is a Play, stop, and pause button. So do, we, do the operators need training on the robot itself then? Do they have to go through a robot training? Or is it just the interface? What, what level of training is recommended? We recommend at least one person from the facility be trained for the robot. That way they know how to kind of operate the robot, uh, how to kind of code it more effectively. Uh, that's typically either the champion of the project or you know, maybe the operator or, uh, or maintenance manager. So that's probably the person to be trained up for it and kind of know the ins and outs of the robot. Obviously, no system is perfect. Um, what are some reasons you get called after the deployment? Are there things that happen that you maybe need? We do need to interface with them or help them out. Is there mostly kind of operator changes? Maybe they've done something to the system where they've kind of tweaked the end stop a little bit, or they've knocked over a sensor and moving box by hand, or they've added. Let's say, for a good example, our customer had it working great. We dropped it in two days. We were out of there. We got a call a week later that they added a tape machine overhead and that was making the robot crash into it. Because again, the robot's blind, doesn't know to avoid that. If you add in an obstacle in the way, it'll just crash into it and <laughs> put it to stop over and over again, every time. Okay, so just if they, they modify their, anything upstream in the process. Yeah, any kind of changes they do you know, physically will affect you know, usually how the robot reacts. Right, but box changes, that, that's something the operator could reprogram, it sounds like. Correct, either modify, create a new SKU for that box and the recipe for it. Now, what makes palletizing one of those low-hanging fruit applications? Why, this, why is this a great start for automation? Sure, so again, with that built-in uh, UR cap, so kind of the software for it, uh, it's got a nice, very intuitive GUI. It makes it very easy for new people, new to automation, uh, to get their hands on it. Uh, very minimal coding. So all of it's kind of on that GUI interface on the Teach Pendant. It's all right there in front of you. It's got nice visual cues for you. So even if you don't know the nitty gritty of how to code the robots, you can see at a glance, kind of it's drag and drop, kind of key in some values, and it's good to go. It's kind of a very approachable first step into the you know, coding or automation process. And what would be the downside? Because this comes up all the time. Everyone, they get a, a piece of high technology. And they say, well, if I'm going to spend this much money on a robot, um, I want it to do everything in the application. This happens all the time. What are the, some of the disadvantages of taking the kind of all-at-once approach uh, for your first project? Sure. So just ask complexity. Uh, of course, a lot more factors you've got to account for. Um, you know, with automating, you've got to keep in mind the human element. Uh, keep in mind what the operator is doing that kind of requires some kind of intuitive human, you know, processing power and like thinking. 
There are usually some kind of small variations in their parts, in their process, in their fixturing. Things we might not even notice. An operator comes in and takes the part slightly. They come in and shift you know, the part a little bit back and forth. They kind of adjust their fixturing. All those little tweaks that we don't think about, the robot has to then translate to code and kind of somehow account for that uh, variation. And so those little human you know, mannerisms, little human you know, uh, factor that goes into it, is hard to replicate with automation. There are options. You can do things like grippers that have compliance. You can do the built-in force of the robot to kind of account for some kind of force touch offs offsets or surface fines. You can do things like um, 3D cameras. But of course, all that stuff kind of adds in more complexity, uh, more complicated programs, and then more cost, of course, more tooling, more custom software or custom uh, hardware. So uh, as an engineer, I value my time. And so all I heard, engineering, 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 uh, very costly. Oh, the palletizer, I didn't hear really engineering once. Um, so it seems like just a much lower cost of ownership. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense. The reason why the palletizer is a pretty good startup too is because it's very simple. The tooling is a lot more narrowed down to just getting the right kind of gripper you know, installed in the robot. I'd say gripper and cable management and you're set up for most applications. Just getting the right tooling to pick up that kind of material, whether it be a box or a pail or bucket. As long as you get that kind of initial spec in, then you're good from there on. As far as a uh, reception to this, obviously the robot is now doing the full end of line palletizing. There are people upstream that were doing it before. What's the general reaction you see from the people on the production line? Uh, depends person to person, but I'd say overall, when it comes in, there is also usually like an initial like kind of apprehensiveness. People are kind of scared of it. They think it could be a little bit dangerous. They think it could be, you know, a scary robot's going to take over their job. As a whole, that's not the case. Uh, good workers are very valued for companies, and so we don't want to replace workers. We want to kind of give them better jobs. We want to kind of take care of all the nitty-gritty aspects of their job, all the repetitive, dangerous, and dirty work, and give them the fun jobs, the ones where humans excel at. And so I'd say uh, pretty quickly, attitudes change. Um, once the robot gets deployed, people get kind of used to it. They see it kind of working. They kind of get the idea for it. They see it as more of a tool than a replacement or a competition for them. And so once it's more visual of, like, this is a tool to make my life easier, it's my assistant, then it kind of opens up the door for them to kind of come in, be more friendly with it. We see them start naming the robot, uh, you know, calling it their little buddy, their little friend, and it just makes their life easier. Because believe me, it does make life easier. <laughs> From having to palletize for the two days, you know, moving boxes around, it does <laughs> make life significantly easier to have a little robot doing <laughs> the hard work for you, heavy lifting. This is Jarvis, we love him. <laughs> and it has simplified the whole end line process. Um, it's made it very easy for us, very efficient. Uh, we, we know we have two pallets we can fill before we have to move it. Uh, it it's just really, helped us out a lot. We don't have to use as many people. Um, it, the physical part of it is taken away that part too. So now we just have to concentrate on our midline. My life has changed ever since we have staggering stacks. I'm able to move around and check my bags and help the computer over there too. And by the time I'm done over there, my stacking is done already. Much better. <laughs>